What's going on, ID Podcast listeners? Hey guys, thank you for joining us on the show today. We hope you are having a wonderful day wherever you are joining us from. We are here in beautiful Costa Rica and uh, just finished up an excellent interview with Dr. Stephen Stozny. And Stephen is a founder of Compassion Power and recently just came out with a book called Empowered Love. It's one of many books he's released. He's worked with over 6,000 clients to help them deal with various forms of anger, abuse, and violence and has appeared on the Oprah, says the Oprah Winfrey Show. I just call it Oprah. I think people know what it is, right? (laughs) Oprah, yeah. The Today Show, CBS Sunday This Morning, and also all of the big print publications you know of, New York Times, Washington Post, U.S. News, and also taught at the University of Maryland and St. Mary's College and has nearly 12 million views on his blog at psychologytoday.com. So he has quite the content distribution and knowledge out there to help people improve their relationships. And today we talk about emotional habits, how to recognize them, and how the toddler brain in us tends to blame, deny, and avoid, and how this is... to take over. Yeah, (laughs) and and so in a relationship, you know that feeling when your partner says something you don't like, and you just, your emotions kind of take control, and you react in a way that hopefully later on you regretted, which I am definitely guilty of doing it. That is our toddler brain, so it's formed... When you're young and and we have a tendency to retreat to that when we become adults and it's magnified in our relationships because we're constantly dealing with people and a person and those emotions are coming up. So oftentimes this is a root of conflict. So Dr. Stozny gives us great information to how on how to deal with it. And you may be asking yourself how you can eliminate these emotional bad habits in your life and in your relationship. And Stephen gives us a bunch of exercises that we can do to help eliminate those bad habits. And one of the, one of the recommend recommendations he gives is, wasn't it there doing it 600 repetitions? So doing it 12 times a day for six weeks. And that is a potential way to help eliminate these bad habits. Yeah, it was a research project that he had, and he had them go through an exercise, but that might sound pretty intimidating, but it's actually, you don't have to sit down and drill it, but if you make an effort that every time you feel that anger, and then rather than letting those emotions take over your response, ask yourself, why are you feeling this? What's the underlying thing? Don't be so quick to blame and ask maybe, how can I make this situation better? Uh, I, you have to laugh. He, he gave an example that early in his marriage, he blamed his wife for the rain at a picnic. And that's how bad, I mean, he admits yeah. that, that he was in it. And, and so we can definitely be on the extreme. Before we continue on to our episode today, we have an announcement and that's that we are doing a retreat in Hood River, Oregon this summer. Yeah. Hood River is an amazing spot and there is no better way to improve your relationship than trying new things together. And Hood River is the perfect place to do this. It's in the Columbia River Gorge. It's a national scenic byway. It is stunning. We've spent about five summers there. I always go there uh, for stand-up paddle racing, and we will be doing a lot of fun activities with you guys. There's whitewater rafting. We'll be doing stand-up paddle boarding, waterfall hikes, wine tasting in the vineyards there are and there's orchards and it's absolutely beautiful you have mount hood which is almost an 11,000 foot mountain that's covered in snow in the middle of summer and and it's just a beautiful place and we want to share it with you guys and we will also be doing relationship strengthening exercises each day so you're going to be doing all these new things which is always good for your relationship and also doing deliberate practice in your communication and a lot of other things that will be led by a professional therapist. So we are looking forward to sharing this uh, this exciting time with you guys. Yeah, the retreat is going to be held on July 28th through August 2nd. 
in Hood River, Oregon, like we said. And uh, you can find out more information on the retreat on our website at idopodcast.com. You can go up at, up at the top of the website and you'll see where it says retreats and uh, you'll find all the information, uh, even more details um, than what we said. And of course, if you have any questions, um, send them our way. Yeah. And you can also check the show notes for that link. And we had a lot of inquiries for our Costa Rica retreat, but we didn't really give enough time leading up to it for international travel. People were trying to get their passports sorted and and we definitely are going to put Costa Rica on the, on the agenda for 2019. But for, for this year, we thought it would be a lot easier for you guys. You fly into Portland. It's super easy to get to. And uh, it's kind of like it's it's not a well-known place, I feel like, because I didn't really know about Hood River too much, but it is like this hidden gem. It's not too hidden. A fair amount of people <laughs> in the Pacific Northwest know about it, but it is it is stunning. You'll, you'll see the pictures on our website, and you'll see why it's such a special place. And uh, yeah, we, we'd be excited to have you guys there and, and share it with you. So we hope you guys enjoyed today's show. And again, check out idopodcast.com or the show notes for information on the Hood River Couples Retreat. And we will definitely be talking about it more in the future. Hi, Stephen. Thanks so much for joining us on the show today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Stephen, we've given our listeners a little overview of your extensive background in helping people with their relationships. So why don't you take a minute, tell us about yourself and why you enjoy the work that you do. Uh, well, uh, I got into this field, uh, actually, I got interested in it at the age of three because I grew up in a very violent home. Uh, and when I uh, went to graduate school, it seemed that I wanted to prevent homes from being like that. And the best way to do that is try to enhance and enrich relationships. So I started with a very pathological population and worked my way to a very normal population, trying to keep them from going wrong. Well, that is quite the journey starting at, at three. And then here you are, you got a book out and, and, uh, many books. Yeah. And, <laughs> a new book, but many books. And, and I'm sure you have helped a lot of people along the way. And today is a topic that we haven't really talked about on the show and is something specifically and is something that I, I think will help a lot of people. And that is how the forming of our emotional habits when we're younger can affect how we relate in a loving relationship. So why don't we start by having you describe uh, how our, our emotional habits are formed, and then we could talk about how they affect uh, our, ourselves in, in, uh, in our loving relationships. Okay, well, well, just as a background, your brain loves habits. Uh, and the reason is they're metabolically cheap. The difference in doing something habitually and having to think about it is many millions of multi-firing neurons. So the brain will do as much by habit as possible. And recent research shows that over uh, well over 60% of our daily activities are habituated. Uh, now, you're most likely to fall into habits in familiar environments and in interactions with familiar people, which means the people you love. So that's when you're most likely to uh, activate any kind of habit. Uh, and the habit, uh, all animals, not just humans, will retreat to previously learned habits under stress. So when we're under stress with loved ones, we're likely to go back to emotional rate as far back as toddlerhood. And the reason for that is love relationships make you feel the most powerless over your own emotions and the most dependent on someone else for your well-being uh, that you've experienced since you were two years old. So that's why they're more likely to get activated in love relationships. Now, the, the, the main habits... Uh, that cause problems in relation, I call them toddler brain habits because they started at about two, are blame, denial, and avoidance. 
if you go into a room and a toddler has broken something, you ask them what happened, they will blame it on someone else. Uh, my daughter was an only <laughs> child. She used to say, Jimmy, do it. That was her imaginary friend. <laughs> she's now a I'm lawyer. for our daughter to do that. <laughs> she's now a lawyer because she figured out that Jimmy defense wasn't very good. <laughs> <laughs> so if blame doesn't work, you ask them what happened to the lamp. I don't know. Denial. And if that doesn't work, they're hiding. Avoidance. So blame, denial, and avoidance, two-year-olds begin doing, and that's what we tend to do under stress in our relationships. The toddler brain takes over, and all we can do is blame, deny, or avoid. It's pretty incredible that uh, if you look at it as yourself as a, a grown toddler, which we basically are. <laughs> in, in that under stress, treat, we are. <laughs> right. Well, we're, yes, exactly. And, and, uh, it, it's pretty, if you can even just keeping that in, in the front of your mind and being present with that thought can help us probably not retreat into those automatic reactions. Are there any other activities? How can we not have these habitual blaming, denying and avoidance responses? Well, because those habits are so reinforced by, uh, for so many years, you're not going to be able to eliminate them. But what you have to do is catch yourself doing it. In other words, when you have an impulse to blame, ask yourself, well, how can I make this better? See, blame is focused on how bad it is and who caused it, uh, where improvement has to be focused on, on how to make it better. Improvements in the future... Uh, blame is in the past. So that's what I trained myself to do because I, you know, I grew up in an angry household. So my instinct is to blame somebody when something goes wrong. I remember when I was first married, like 40 years ago, he blamed my wife because it rained during our picnic. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that, that's when I realized how uh, irrational this impulse to blame is. <laughs> She was not responsible for the rain. <laughs> uh, so I trained myself to say, rather than blame, how can I make this a little bit better? If I, I couldn't do anything about the rain, but how can I make it ple more pleasant for myself being in the rain? <laughs> uh, and when you start to think of that, how you can make it better, you activate the adult brain because the toddler brain is just an alarm. It can't see, they can't solve problems. They can't keep themselves safe. All they can do is sound an alarm. Something's wrong. And an adult has to come and fix it. When you see how to fix it yourself, that activates the adult brain. So that's the quickest way to get into the adult brain under stress. Now, the adult brain also has values. The toddler brain's mostly feelings. The adult brain has values. What's values are what's most important to you, worthy of uh, appreciation, time, effort, and sacrifice. And that's really what love is about. It's not about feelings. It's about values. So when you go into your adult brain, uh, it will regulate the feeling. I'm feeling really resentful, but I love you and I want us to feel close and connected. And when you are connected, it's much easier to negotiate about behavior choices than when you're disconnected. When you're disconnected, you get into the toddler brain and all of your arguments can be reduced to one of you saying mine or my way and the other saying no. Those are the favorite two words of the toddler, mine and no. We can really relate to that right now because we have a two and a half year old and, and right now her the two words that she's using the most are mine and no. Yeah, well, it's, <laughs> so de we, it's developmentally we appropriate because toddler is the first stage of development where children really understand they're different from their parents. See, the, before that, there's a kind of merging. They think you know what they're thinking and feeling, and they're thinking and feeling the same thing you are, and that gives them a sense of security. Uh, but at toddlerhood, they recognize that they they have a different agenda from yours. <laughs> uh, and 
uh, and that makes them feel insecure. So they want to have as many possessions as they can. So everything is mine. And they don't know who they are, obviously, because identity comes from, from more from the adult brain. But they know who they're not. They're not whatever you want. So that's how you get the no, <laughs> mine and no. No, I gave a, a talk to a group of psychologists re- recently, and one of the, them had a toddler, and I was talking about uh, denial in in, uh, in toddler brain, and sh- she came up to me during one of the breaks and said, you know, my daughter uh, was two and a half. She opened the door and let the cat out, and I said, did you let the cat out? No. There he is. He's right in the yard, and the, the child looked out and said, that's not him. <laughs> <laughs> it was just hilarious so, because they will yeah. go to any lengths to uh, to uh, uh, blame, deny, or avoid. So when it comes to habits and creating good habits and trying to get rid of bad habits, I feel like when it comes to habits, good habits are so much harder to create than getting rid of you know, or actually getting rid of bad habits are, well, they're, that's equally as hard, I guess, as creating good habits. But, you know, and I've heard somewhere, I've read somewhere that it takes like 21 days to create a new habit. Is that true? Or is there any advice in terms of creating new habits or how to do it best? Yeah, it, it depends on how much the old habit is reinforced. And emotion regulation habits have been reinforced since you were two. So they're much stronger than behavioral habits. See, behavioral habits are things like when you uh, when you smell the cookies, you want one, that kind of thing. Uh, those are easier to handle. Emotions are so much faster than conscious attention that you're already motivated to approach, avoid, or attack before you know what you're, you, before you can formulate that into any kind of thought. So the way you have to um, regulate or, or form new emotional habits is by practice. Our research shows it takes about 600 repetitions to really change an emotion regulation habit. We've developed a couple of techniques for doing that. You practice them. They only take less than a minute. You practice them like 12 times a day for six weeks, and then that forms a new emotion regulation habit. So the, the habit that gets us into trouble is Something will happen, and it'll cause a sudden drop in self-value. In other words, you'll feel insulted, disregarded, disrespected. Uh, And what you should do, the habit you want to develop is when you feel devalued, do something that will make you feel more valuable. (laughs) But what we have learned to do from toddlerhood is – to blame, deny, or avoid, which gives us adrenaline. And the adrenaline temporarily makes you feel more powerful. So instead of wanting to feel more valuable, we want to feel more powerful. Now, what makes you feel valuable are attachment behaviors, uh, compassion, kindness, interest, trust, love. All of those make you feel more valuable. But when we choose power over value, we're going to probably devalue our loved ones, which is going to make it much, much worse. There is uh, so much to unpack here, and it's really fascinating, the research that you mentioned. So what can someone do? You, you, you said like 600 repetitions of an exercise to change an emotional habit. What Can you give us the specific exercise or an exercise that, that someone could do to, to try to get those gut reactions, those negative ones out of their system? Yeah, we, we actually have three of them because we deal with uh, uh, clients in highly distressed uh, relationships. But I, I'll give you the one that, that is really for everybody. Whenever you get angry or resentful, uh, you're not just angry or resentful. In fact, that's one of the discoveries in, in how a emotions work is that you never just have one discrete emotion. There's, a, there's like a family of emotions. 
uh, because emotion is stimulated by change, either in the environment or by something you're thinking or, or, or a physiological change even, or something you remember. The change activates the emotion, but your brain doesn't know which emotion is going to be appropriate, so it'll activate several, and then whichever one you focus on comes into consciousness. Now, most of us get into the habit of focusing on the strongest emotion, anger, when there's a change. A prime example of that is when you're driving uh, and something abrupt happens, like a car whizzes by you or cuts you off or something. That gives you a shot of adrenaline. Now, what you've got there is uh, three emotions, fear, shame, because you feel like you're devalued by this other driver who doesn't know you, but <laughs> it's not rational, and anger. Those three. Now, what we tend to focus on is the anger. So you get angry when somebody does that. But there's also fear and shame. So an easy way to regulate emotions, it, if I'm angry, what might I also be afraid of? And what might I also be ashamed of? And as soon as you do that, the focus goes to the all three emotions equally, and you're not nearly as angry. So just practice that. What am I afraid of? What, what am I ashamed of? See, the shame, shame in relationships is really important because it, we feel shame when we violate our deeper values. But it's not a punishment. It's a motivation to be true to your deeper values. So if you, uh, when, when you're angry at a loved one or resentful, you're also feeling shame. The shame will lead you to for, reform your emotional bond. The anger is going to damage it. I love that analogy of driving down the road because I think anyone that's driven on a highway can relate. Uh, and, and it is fascinating how we go towards anger as as a natural response, and and just I'm you know I'm I'm thinking about this in my head, just instances where. I'm I'm human. I'm getting angry more often than I would like, <laughs> probably every day. But I feel like I'm a, a pretty well balanced person. But but we all are going to experience that. But even whether it's in our relationship or like if I'm waiting in line and and you know practicing it there, like instead of getting angry and impatient, like asking myself, well, what am I? Why am I feeling this way? What am I afraid of being late? And and probably more often than not. The underlying case is is something I don't want to say trivial, but but like maybe when we we understand it, we go, you know, this is it's silly to be feeling this way. Yeah, well, uh, you know, re resentment keeps you focused on thing what you don't want and how you don't want to feel. Uh, when you're waiting in line, what cause when people get irritated is that it's usually because. They think they shouldn't have to wait in line. Resentment's the tyranny of the shoulds. It shouldn't be that way. It should be this way. Uh, and whenever you focus on something you can't control, like how long the line is, <laughs> you feel powerless. But if you focus on what you can control, like making it more interesting for yourself, think waiting in line, you know, think of some problem that you have to solve at work or something, or um, think of something you like, make the experience of waiting in line better, then you're not irritated and your life has more meaning, more vitality when you learn to do that. And another exercise I, I like to try to do when I find myself getting angry is, is and we've talked about this before on a, an episode we talked about with, with compassion, is kind of putting yourself in that other person's uh, shoes, you know, like maybe that person that's sped by, maybe they just didn't even see you, or maybe they're in a rush because there's been a family emergency, or the person that's in line who's working, they have this whole line of people that they have to deal with, you know, and you're just kind of standing there. So kind of putting yourself in the other people's position may put some perspective on your feelings of maybe, maybe your life isn't so bad. <laughs> well, what it does is it gets you more in touch with your basic humanity. 
When we feel humane, we like ourselves better. When you're angry, you're actually demonizing someone. You're assuming the worst about their intentions. I mean, I've had people who were court ordered because they uh, did something really aggressive when they got cut off on the highway. And in their mind, that person knew everything about them and was purposely disrespecting them. Uh, and, uh, of course, it wasn't that at all. They either didn't see them or they were, in fact, in studies of aggressive driving, uh, when someone cuts someone else off, they usually were cut off themselves a few cars down the road. <laughs> And it got them aggressive, and then they drove aggressively. Aggressive driving passes car by car down the road. Yeah, and in the same way, I'm I'm just picturing like it like that negativity is spreading car by car, and that's in the opposite, it's something positive. Like if you smile at someone, and are you passing up, passing on positivity with your partner or with someone on the road or in line, then they're probably going to be more likely to, to pass that on. Yeah, well, we actually did an experiment that showed that of just walking down, we had graduate students walking down the street, uh, not not really smiling, just looking like, the, we called it a look of respect. You're looking at this person as you're passed by them like they're a valuable person. But you don't say anything. You just think that. But what you're thinking changes your emotional demeanor. And the people as they pass by began doing that to other people. Emotion contagion is very powerful. The problem with emotional contagion, though, is that it has a negative bias because uh, negative emotions are more important to immediate survival. So they get priority processing in the brain. Uh, in fact, studies show that you need about five positive uh, acts for every one negative just for it to be neutral. When it starts going above five to one, life gets good. When it goes below five to one, it starts getting bad. And that's good to apply to your communication with the partner. Like if you have something you want to express and it might be negative, but something you need to bring up, make sure that it's not being outweighed uh you know you need five times as much positivity in there to uh to keep some sort of balance yeah well the the trick with that is the positivity has to be routine so that when something negative does come up it doesn't stand out because you planted all those flowers so this little rock in your garden is not going to be that noticeable <laughs> but if there aren't many yep. flowers then the rock's going to stand out you know, it's funny, when that five-to-one ratio first came to light, my daughter was a teenager then. You know, teenage girls can sometimes get kind of fresh mouth. They can't help it, but they grow <laughs> out of it. She was sweet by the time she was 18, <laughs> but she was 15 then, and she said something, you know, really disrespectful, and I wanted to say something disrespectful back. And But I thought, if I say this, I'm going to have to come up with five positive things. <laughs> It's not worth it. It's a lot harder. That's one way to look at it. Yeah. Yeah. It's like credit card debt. It keeps growing exponentially. Yeah, it's so true. Well, we talked a little bit uh, about blame and and when that habit comes up. How how does denial and avoidance uh, manifest itself in a relationship? Before we continue on, we're going to take a short break to tell you about our sponsors. So the first thing I thought about when I heard about Lola is that Chase and all the other men out there are going to be rejoicing. And that's because no more trips to the drugstore to buy their wife's or their girlfriend's tampons. Yeah, you were <laughs> nice to me and probably only nice. made me do that once or twice out of desperation. And of course <laughs> I obliged, but it is, I mean, we're all grown ups yeah. here, but it is a little It'll awkward be nice for, for a guy. nice for you men out there, yeah. for sure. <laughs> well, Lola is a monthly subscription that delivers a fully customizable box of organic tampons, pads, and liners right to your doorstep. And I love how you can personalize exactly how many tampons and pads are in your box. And most importantly, they are 100% organic 
and BPA free. So we all care about the ingredients and the food we eat and the beauty products we use. So why should it be any different for our feminine care products? A crazy fact that we learn is that the FDA doesn't require brands to disclose a comprehensive list of ingredients in their feminine care products. So most of them don't. Major brands use a mix of synthetic ingredients in their products, including rayon and polyester. Their feminine care products may also be treated with harsh chemicals, cleansing agents, fragrance, and dyes. Yuck. (laughs) Yuck. (laughs) Sorry, I had to add that in there. (laughs) Yuck. Lola allows you to select your shipment frequency and cancel, skip an order, or modify your subscription anytime. Lola will email you two days before your box ships, and they pride themselves on no surprises or gimmicks. So for 40% off your first order, visit mylola.com and enter the promo code I do when you subscribe. That's mylola, M-Y-L-O-L-A dot com. And enter the promo code I do, mylola.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30 day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash I do podcast. There are over 180,000 titles to choose from, including our recommended book, Love Lands, by psychotherapist and previous guest on our show, Dr. Deborah Campbell. Chase and I are both in the middle of reading the book, and it's pretty amazing. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash I do podcast. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash I do podcast to get your free audiobook of Lovelands. Well, denial is, uh, it's two ways. One is denying the complexity of it, so you're oversimplifying. But it's usually denying responsibility. So, uh, uh, you know, I didn't do that, or it's not my fault that happened, it's someone else. Or I don't know. Uh, I didn't know that I was looking at that, that uh <laughs> I'm going to use Chris Hemsworth. My my wife has a crush on Chris Hemsworth, <laughs> you know, the Thor character. Who doesn't? So, oh, I didn't know I was I staring at him with his shirt off. <laughs> that's that's denial. Um, blame is the primary one, though. And the others often follow from blame. If you feel blamed, then you're likely to deny or avoid. That's why blame. One of my favorite quotes from book. I think I put it in every book I wrote. The road to psychological ruin begins with blame. Yeah, you're not taking personal responsibility, and 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 that's one of the and you're losing power. Things. You can't make it better when you blame it on someone else. Uh, see what you get out of blame. It's a temporary transference of shame. It's not my fault, it's your fault. So it's scapegoating someone else. But what you lose is the ability to make your experience better. (laughs) So for that momentary reduction in shame, you're making yourself powerless. But, you know, these are defenses designed by toddlers. They're not going to be clever. (laughs) What I tell people is you you wouldn't drive in a car designed by a toddler or ride in a plane designed by a toddler. So don't use coping mechanisms designed by a toddler. (laughs) So true. It's actually cute when toddlers do it. (laughs) It's not so cute when adults adults. do it. Yeah, well, I'll have to, we'll have to keep reminding ourselves when, when Stella keeps telling us, no, 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 mine, mine, and, and, and all of the, those things, as long as, as long as we can get it out of her when, when she's 18 or make her aware of it. And, and hopefully before 18. Yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah. The mine and no actually goes away at about three and a half. Then they get really oh, sweet so we, again. <laughs> we'll, we'll look forward to that. But you know what it is? They figure out that they can be themselves and still have a, a good relationship with you. And they get confused about that and then they're two. But by three, three and a half, they, they, they know that they can love you and disagree with you. And, and one of the, the themes like we just 
talking about blame and we talk about it on this show is oftentimes in a relationship, we have the power to to make the change that we want. Well, a lot of times if we go to the toddler blame and we blame our partner, well, they're not doing this. Uh, they're not taking out the trash. They're not communicating with me the way I want. When if we take some ownership, yeah, they might not, they may be transgressing. They may be not the best partner at the moment, but it doesn't mean we need to blame them because that's not going to have a good outcome. But what we can do is take steps to take control and, and that we can repair the relationship all on our own. You need some involvement, but it can be initiated by, by yourself. Yeah, well, actually, blame predicts that it's going to get worse, not better. See, blame denial and avoidance never makes anything better. Blame causes resentment and comes out of your own resentment and causes resentment in the person you're blaming. What you um, see, where, where people get confused about resentment is it feels very different on the inside than it looks on the outside. When you're resentful, you feel like you're being treated unfairly. You're you're being disregarded or devalued in some way, or you're feeling hurt if it's somebody you love. But uh, that's not the way it looks on the outside. I tell people to, to do a mirror test. Think of something that you really resent. You know, it's not fair. It shouldn't be this way. And when you do that, you'll just automatically look away from the mirror because when you're resentful, you can't make eye contact, <laughs> not even with yourself. But for this experiment, hold on to that resentful thought. I can't believe that she's doing that. It shouldn't be this way. And look up at the mirror and you'll see what the world sees. You don't look like a victim. You look mean and unfriendly, aggressive. So that's what people are responding to. Even though you feel like you're being mistreated, people are responding to you like you're mistreating them. Because all they see is what's on the outside. They don't see the hurt inside. So what are some steps that someone could take? Let's say that they're having this blaming reaction and they can ask themselves, how can I make this better? But let's say that the the partner that they're they're feeling resentment or, or they're blaming for the situation, let's say that they really are uh, transgressing and, and they're not being a... Uh, they're not communicating well, whatever it is. How can, besides, you know, asking ourselves how we can make it better, how then can we bring that up with our, our partner in the best way to, to move forward together? Well, you don't want to do it while you're both emotionally aroused because there you're just going to be attacking each other. Uh, so you, you want to regulate the resentment and anger a little bit before you do it. If you want a response, it, it's always good to expose vulnerability uh, in a relationship because then you're you're not it doesn't come off so as so much as blaming uh, and the way that would look like you know I know you didn't mean to hurt my feelings when you said that but it did and I just want to point that out to you but I, I know you don't really want to hurt my feelings see and then the the partner doesn't have to be defensive because you're, you're saying they didn't mean it and they can focus on what you're really saying. You can't focus on what someone's saying when you're defensive. All you're trying to do is refute it. So owning the vulnerability is important. See, vulner uh, intimate relationships have to have vulnerability uh, and the problem with the resentment is you don't show vulnerability. You just show attack mode all the time. And that's why eventually it destroys a relationship. Resentment is degenerative. It doesn't get better on its own. Uh, and eventually it leads to contempt and disgust. That example you gave of, of saying, I know you didn't want to really hurt my feelings, but you did. It, it, like that is such a powerful, and we talked about it before, but using I statements rather than you statements. And just hearing you say that, I know when Sarah comes at me, even if I'm wrong, and she says you, 
I just, it's that toddler brain. It like, it just takes over and we want to defend ourselves. We want to blame or deny or avoid. And, and it's such a powerful thing. And I definitely try to work on that and break that reaction. But I think you're going to have to be like a Buddhist monk or like go away on the mountain and meditate to, to never do it any <laughs> at all. Like, yeah. so, but if Sarah can come at me with, I feel this way, it, I just, it's just not even, that reaction is just not even going to be there. Uh, it's such a powerful thing. And it's an example of taking the power into your own hands and, and your partner may be wrong, but you can address the situation and be proactively moving in a great direction just by saying, I know you didn't mean to hurt me, but it, it, it's such a powerful thing. Yeah, but but I do want to caution your your listeners about one thing. I I don't like to model words uh, uh, what I should say when I'm aroused because then it, it, it has a good chance because you have to translate the feeling into words it has a good chance of coming off as phony or manipulative. Rather, what you want to do, keep in mind, is you want to focus on your common value. Your common value is the emotional bond between you, and you both want that. You both want to feel close and connected. So how are we going to feel closer and more connected? We're not going to do it by saying, you hurt my feelings. We're going to do it by uh, uh, I, I know you don't want to hurt my feelings. That's our common, and I don't want to hurt your feelings. <laughs> That's our common value. So focus on what the common value is. That that works very well with disagreements about the children too. You know, parents always will have some disagreements about how how to raise children or what interventions to make. But if you focus on the common value that you both want the best interests of this child, uh, it's much easier to negotiate. And I feel like when you say like what you said, I, I know you don't mean to hurt my feelings. It takes away any element of potential criticism that that the other that your partner could feel by saying, you know, you did this. So I think it definitely eliminates any more potential conflict to arise from that situation. Uh, unless the, your partner is so emotionally aroused. See, when you're very emotionally aroused, you will perceive it almost anything as an attack. Uh, that's why I, I prefer that pe- I, people don't try to interact until they can get to their core value, I call it, get to that place where they want to make it better. If in, When you're resentful or angry, you don't want to make it better. It's not for ties. It's for prevailing, for winning. The, the other person has to submit. Uh, and it's very hard, no matter what words you use, to take that emotional tone out of it. So it's much better to regulate the emotion and then get to where your common value is. You want to feel more closer and more connected. See, another problem we talk about in empowered love is that uh, feelings, uh, when you you focus on feelings, uh, whatever it is, say, I feel resentful. When you focus on the resentment, your brain will load into implicit memory lots of other times you felt resentful. And you're likely to select a behavior from those past resentments. And that's probably going to be critical, (laughs) controlling, demanding, uh, and it's going to make it worse. But if you focus on how you want to feel, So that would look like I feel resentful, but I want to feel close and connected. Then your brain will load into implicit memory other times you felt close and connected. And you'll select a behavior more likely to get you there because those were times when you were more open, you were more flexible, more compassionate, kinder, more affectionate. Uh, And that'll get you where you want to go, where resentment's going to take you in the opposite direction. So validate how you feel, but focus on how you want to feel. That's another great exercise to to do. And and we talked about blame and then asking ourselves how we can make this better and then 
this is, you know, when we feel angry, asking ourselves and focusing on how we want to feel. And to me, like a lot of the things we talk about, it's like, yeah, easier said than done, but it's important to, to start creating that habit. And I think what's been valuable to me, and I always say I need to do it more, but is mindfulness and, and meditation. And where do you find that fitting in to be able to get those crazy, angry emotions and not let them get the best of us and take that pause and ask these questions? Uh, mindfulness is very helpful, but it's extremely difficult to do when you're emo already emotionally aroused. Uh, what I find helpful is that all emotions, the, 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 first of all, we stress feelings way too much. The feelings are the least important aspect of, of emotions. They're the slowest. They're, that's what you're consciously aware of. Uh, the slowest part of it, long before you feel anything, you're already motivated uh, to do one of three behaviors. Approach. Approach means you want to have more of that person. You want to experience more of them. You're interested in them. Uh, avoid. You're not interested in them. You want them out of your cone of per perception. Or attack. You're perceiving them as a threat and you want to neutralize the threat by devaluing them. So rather than focus on the feeling, which is going to be very often too little, too late, say, you know, I, I, I have this impulse to avoid or attack. Do I really want to do that? Is that going to make my relationship better? No, it's not. So it's easier to, to focus on the motivation than it is the feeling. So feeling comes after the emotions already activated and and certainly asking ourselves those questions and how do you get better at, at that though just just practice. doing it like practice practice you know, all, yeah. the, the brain acquires habits in only one way uh, and that's through repetition and whatever you do repeatedly will become a habit whether you want it or not um I try to explain in the book about the laws of focus. Whatever you focus on uh, becomes more important than what you're not focused on. In fact, repeated focus is what a habit really is. And the dendrites in the brain of the synaptic connections of that particular thing you're focusing on actually grow larger. They become physically bigger. Uh, so, and whatever you focus on repeatedly becomes a habit. So if you want to change your life, you got to choose what you're going to focus on. <laughs> the resentment and toddler brain makes you focus on what you don't want and how you don't want to feel. And whatever you focus on, you're going to get more of. <laughs> so what we try to do is focus on what you do want and, and uh, how you want to feel. So it's not that I'm not going to focus on you didn't take out the trash. I'm going to focus on let's take out the trash. See, that's in the present and of the future where emotions are much more empowered. Empower See, because the emotions are mostly motivations, the word means to move emotion, uh, they lose their power when you think about the past because you can't motivate the past. So whenever you think about the past, there's always a layer of powerlessness over it. But they are very much more empowered in the present and the future. Um, for instance, if you make a mistake and you start thinking, oh, that was stupid, you know, I got all this shame and guilt about the mistake. But you feel far more empowered if you say, the next time, this is what I will do. Because then you're putting it in the future and your emotions work better in the present and future than they do in the past. That's a great thing to, to think about because I know I tend to be hard on myself sometimes in, in all aspects of life and including trying to improve our relationship. And what I found valuable is like the past is gone. I am here now. I am essentially not a new person, but this is me now whatever transgression I did, I'll try to repair, but I am not who I was. 
it, it sounds kind of stoic, but but it, but just that acknowledgement is is powerful in in and then also creating that habit of not doing whatever it is that I did and in, in that that doesn't have power over me. Right. Yeah, um, emotions are primarily motivations. That's what I try to to preach <laughs> because my profession has emphasized feelings way too much. Uh, feelings are important, but they they don't have reality testing. In other words, feelings are they come from the toddler brain. Toddlers can't tell what's really happening from what they're feeling or thinking or imagining or dreaming. It's the prefrontal cortex, the adult brain, that uh, tests reality. Uh, the way to understand that is the toddler brain alarm is like a smoke alarm. Uh, if the smoke alarm goes off, you don't scream, we're all going to die. <laughs> you look to see if there's a fire, because it's probably just somebody smoking or cooking. But it, you look to see if there's a fire, and if there is, you put it out. If you can't put it out, you leave the house. That's what the adult brain is going to tell you to do. The the toddler brain confuses the fire with the alarm. So if the alarm goes off, there is a fire. If I'm angry at you, you must be doing something wrong. And I just have to figure out what it is. If I'm afraid, you must be threatening. So they're self-validating as if they are reality. Feelings are not reality. They're a signal about a possible reality. And the adult brain has to check it out. You pay attention to it. It's an alarm. But you don't assume that it's reality. All alarm systems are calibrated to give positives. In other words, you would rather be wrong 999 times thinking your wife is a saber-toothed tiger than be wrong once thinking a saber-toothed tiger is your wife. <laughs> <laughs> well, S Stephen, that, I, I like I love that analogy and that saying uh, uh, with the smoke alarm and, and that feelings are not reality and keeping that in the front of our minds uh, can be a valuable thing. And then focusing on what is important, focusing on forming these habits, putting your attention there as a way to change these habits. So maybe maybe even write it down or remind yourself every morning um, are going to be valuable things uh, to do. So I think that's a great place to, to leave this interview with, with uh, Sarah and I and with our listeners, focus on creating those good habits. So why don't we finish, finish up by having you tell our listeners where they can find you online and a little bit about your new book, and then we'll say goodbye. Well, our website is CompassionPower.com, and the new book is called uh, uh, em Empowered Love just came out last week, and it's mostly the concepts we've been talking about, uh, a new way of looking at emotions that works much better. Uh, the Feelings are important, but they're not reality. Uh, and if, if you can keep that in mind, you can avoid a lot of the toddler brain issues because the toddler brain makes them reality. If you know that they're not, that helps you switch into the adult brain. The adult brain coping mechanisms are improve, appreciate, connect, and protect. So you want to replace blame, denial, and avoidance with improve, appreciate, connect, protect. And as a reminder, I have that framed on my wall on the side of the bed I sleep in. So when I wake up in the morning, it's the first thing I say. <laughs> There you I go. Love that. <laughs> That's excellent. Well, thank you again so much, Stephen. All our listeners can find uh, the link to your book as well as all the resources from this episode on your show notes page at idopodcast.com. And so we encourage them to go there and check out your new book. And thank you so much for joining us and, and sharing all your great knowledge. Well, thank you for having me. We hope you guys enjoyed today's show. If you want to check out the show notes or the interview links from today's show, head on over to our website at idopodcast.com. Click on the podcast tab and you'll see this interview up at the top, followed by all of our other past interviews. And while you're on our website, check out our 14 day happy couple challenge. We send you a daily email with doable challenges to help strengthen and make your relationship 
even better. And on our website, we also have a bunch of free resources in the form of downloadable guides and workbooks. Um, so, for example, uh, some of the topics include how to cultivate respect in a relationship, how to heal from a bad breakup, step by step guides to help couples manage conflict. Uh, how to affair proof your relationship. Those are just a few of the topics that we talk about uh, in these free guides. So if any of those sound interesting to you, you can check those out on our website at idopodcast.com. We hope you guys enjoyed today's show.